Um, my name is Simon Carney. I'm a research fellow at the Broad Institute of MIT in Harvard and a cardiovascular fellow at the University of Hamburg. And uh, today we'll be talking about the genetic sub-study of the ESAF NOT4 trial. So the original East AFNET 4 trial showed that early rhythm control and atrial fibrillation uh, patients who have uh, atrial fibrillation um, for less than one year is associated with a reduced um, composite outcome of uh, cardiovascular death, stroke, um, hospitalization for acute coronary syndrome or heart failure. And we know that atrial fibrillation is a highly heritable disease and uh, we have been using polygenic risk scores to estimate this genetic burden that uh, every one of us has for certain diseases. And we can do the same for atrial fibrillation and stroke. So we wondered what will happen if we uh, look for the genetic risk in those patients and see uh, the association with the outcomes of the trial. So the East AFNET 4 trial um, in enrolled patients who had uh, atrial fibrillation for less than one year to, to to treat basically in the beginning of the disease. Uh, most patients had atrial fibrillation for less than uh, three months. And um, the design was a one-to-one -one randomization to early rhythm control, which included uh, antirhythmic drugs, uh, catheter ablation, or usual care, which was um, mostly rate control based um, in terms of severe system, despite optimal rate control, Rhythm control was allowed as well, but very, very rarely utilized in, in that arm of the study. And around 1,600 patients um, gave consent to the biomarker substudy, where we got uh, basically also genetic uh, material that we could then um, analyze for common variants and estimate polygenic risk score, uh, in those patients. Uh, so in total for the genetic substudy, we had 1,567 patients that were included and roughly um, half and half in each uh, treatment arm. Um, so it was quite balanced still. So the key findings were, we looked at two uh, polygenic risk scores. So one for atrial fibrillation and one for stroke. And for the polygenic risk score for atrial fibrillation, we found a quite moderate um, association of that score with a recurrent AF in the trial uh, as a time to event uh, analyses. That was to be expected. Um, and for the stroke uh, polygenic risk score, quite unexpectedly, we found no association with stroke, but a association with heart failure. And to further validate this finding, which was unusual and uh, unexpected, we also looked at the polygenic risk score for stroke in the UK Biobank. And there we found a association with atrial fibrillation, stroke, and heart failure. Um, and those uh, basically validated what we saw and also explained um, the reasons why we didn't uh, saw the association with stroke in our trial. The East AFNET 4 trial uh, patient cohort is very, very uh, well treated. Anticoagulation is above 90% in each arm. And in the UK Biobank, it isn't. So in a population that is not anticoagulated, we see a association with stroke with our polygenic risk score. My take home messages are that early rhythm control is effective and safe um, across the genetic risk spectrum and uh, that polygenic risk scores are only as good as the uh, question that we ask and the tools um, that we create from them. So basically that polygenic risk scores that are made in populations that for with no anticoagulation um, are not as uh, powerful in patients who are anticoagulated. So I think the, the key message is here that we still have to learn a lot about polygenic risk scores, but atri uh, atrial fibrillation should probably be treated early in disease history. So I think one of the major, major problems in cardiovascular science um, especially in the genetic field, but also in the clinical field is the lack of diversity. The polygenic risk scores were made, uh, constructed in European uh, populations and used in a poor European population uh, of the trial. And the reason for that is because we don't just, we just don't include enough 
uh, people from minorities, from uh, other ethnic backgrounds, which is a major gap in, in our current understanding of genetics and the application in clinical care. Um, and what we don't have, despite the, the lack of diversity, is a lack of trial data that has um, trial data that also includes genetic data. So we can understand the influence of genetics on treatments. There are large biobanks, but we need to do a better job in getting also bio information from our trial populations. Thank you.